Ah, I was just playing the guitar. It's usually my little guy, you know, lockdown here in uh, San Diego. It's not so much lockdown anymore, but it seems the only time I pick up that guitar is when I'm queuing up to, to get onto Journey's webcast. Hey, I'm Alan Carl, your host. Welcome to the Journey's webcast. Um, I'm just kind of curious. I'm going to put up a poll uh, there. If this is your first time joining us, I always like to know that. So, uh, so certainly in the uh, right column near the chat, introduce yourself, say hello, say hello to the others that are on the on the uh, call today, or what is it? It's a webcast, right? Anyway, I'm so excited to have Rudy Maxa join us today, but before we bring him in, I just wanted to kind of go through a couple um, uh, business items here, at least using the chat. Uh, you can see in the chat column there that uh, if you have a, um, if you have a, a question for Rudy or I, you can... Uh, Type your question in below, and where it says chat mode at the bottom right, if you click that, that'll turn it into Q&A mode. So it'll at least flag the the uh, the chat uh, for us so we know that you're asking a question. Also, if we ever start to, uh, the, the the video starts to get jumbled or it, it freezes, there's a little red um, button at the top of your screen called connect. So go ahead and click that. That'll give you another uh, opportunity to kind of refresh and it uh, usually works. Sometimes we get some hiccups. Uh, let's hope today is going to be good. Um, um, it's so great to have uh, international guests, Terry, New Zealand, Ajay. Welcome back from India and then Peru, Adele. So cool. I love when I do these webcasts, how many people come in. Hey, I just wanted to, uh, before we Tell you, tell you a little bit more about Rudy. I just wanted to um, say that you know, here in San Diego, we are starting to um, loosen up. Um, I actually last week went to a restaurant for the first time. It was outside on a patio, and um, uh, it just felt a little liberating, but a little weird, too. We're seeing cases here, even in my local community, spike. You know, the U.S., uh, despite the fact it's attempts to reopen, we seem to be uh, enduring, um, more cases. So it's, um, it, it, this, this does, uh, affect travel in many ways, not only, uh, um, within our own States and, and, and across state borders, but obviously internationally. And we'll be talking about that, um, that as well. Um, so, uh, I saw Adele as the show begun. So you guys can hear me, right? Um, you know, I, I, according to this, I'm on air. You've the videos on, so uh, hopefully you guys are all um, listening in. Hey, Mike from Montreal, back again. This is good. So um, I'm glad to uh, to see you all. So I, I guess uh, can you hear us again, Adele? You know, just give us a okay there, or if not, um, how about Mike? You can hear us, right? Terry, you can hear us. Okay, cool. We're cool. Um, so anyway, it's, it's, it's a little bit of weird and, um, but, um, uh, um, I'm feeling better. You know, it's been nice. Uh, I, I've, I've upped more of my walking game. I go to the beach every night at sunset. It's, um, it's a great little walk and, uh, and seeing more and more people out, a lot of people wearing masks. So we, 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 despite the, the increase, we are getting, um, some great, uh, uh, people here, at least in San Diego County, that are adhering to what now is a mandatory Governor Newsom, our governor here in California, has gone ahead and um, man masks mandatory because of this um, spike. So I, I mean, for the for the most part, I don't think um, you know my next guest uh, needs much introduction, but he is um, tuning in today. This is this only the second time in nearly two months I've been doing this. Uh, nearly three months, rather, that I've been doing this, that I've had a guest domestically here in the United States. He he hails from uh, Minneapolis, St. Paul. So it, that has been a hot bit of activity. So we'll certainly ask uh, uh, what what it's been like to have uh, feet on the ground there over the last few weeks. Um, but um, let me let me um, tell you a little bit about Rudy Maxa. First of all, he is now the second Emmy Award winning guest on my podcast, on the webcast. So I'm very good. He used to work with the Washington Post as a um, investigative reporter and a columnist. And uh, he was, while he's reporting, actually been nominated for the Pulitzer Prize. 
He joined Washingtonian Magazine as a senior writer and columnist and then uh, became the Washington, D.C. bureau chief for Spy Magazine. So this guy knows a bit about the spooks, I bet you. You know, in the 1990s, he wrote an episode of the uh, infamous ABC TV dramatic series Capital News. And he's got two books, too, right? He's got uh, their nonfiction. One is Dare to be Great and Public Trust private lust as a freelance writer his articles have appeared get this list okay gq playboy ladies home journal penthouse travel and leisure the la times the london evening standard modern maturity and dozens of others but probably he's um most known for his work on radio and television he he started as a, a consumer travel commentator for a public radio business show called marketplace back in the 90s which he then kind of segued that into a one-hour national uh, travel show on public radio called the savvy traveler um that he co-created and uh, hosted for a number of years before launching a television travel series on public television Back in 2001, interesting time to be introducing a television show. Um, his uh, show is called Smart Travels Europe with Rudy Maxa, initially produced with Small World Productions. It was the public television's first high def series. So this guy's not afraid of technology. Maxa became co executive producer for five seasons of Smart Travels before taking it over and owning the show and renaming it Rudy Maxa's World. And then um, by, by the summer, you know, by early this decade, I guess, Maxa had more than 85 half-hour travel shows on public te television. And today they're broadcast uh, overseas uh, by the Travel Channel and translated into something like 20 different languages. He also hosts a, the most widely syndicated radio travel show, Rudy Maxa's World. It's a two-hour weekend interview show broadcast on 115 news and talk stations, as well as on XM radio channel 165 so without further ado let's get uh, rudy in the room yeah well thank you for that interview we're gonna have to update that we had 98 shows on pbs and 425 radio stations on a radio show now called rm travel rm world travel but uh anyway here i am i'm delighted to be here um al and i both started webcasts about the same time he is much more efficient he's got much better graphics <laughs> he's much technically more facile than i am I think I've done 10 or 11, and only last week did we have no technical glitches, whereas he seems to pull it off every single week. And I've learned a lot from him. I always call him up and go, what did I do wrong? Oh, my goodness. And he tells yeah. me what to do. Anyway. It's always good. We have we we, we have these post webcast, uh, you know, uh, post mortem calls, right? Yeah. <laughs> I'm not te technologically proficient. Uh, the fact it was a high definition series was, anyway, I'm not supposed to be yeah. on radio TV. I, I'm a writer. I'm a magazine writer, uh, print writer. And, and I only lost yeah. the by one vote, as I like to say, Alan, but who remembers? Who remembers, right? You know, you never remember who loses. You remember who, who yeah. wins. I don't yeah. know. But, you know, I'm, it, we've got some more people jumping into the room. Andre from Phoenix. This is cool. My brother, Jonathan Carl, ABC White House correspondent, who's been on your webcast, actually. He was, he was a great guest a couple of weeks ago. He was fabulous. He had a lot of hits on YouTube. Right? Yeah. Yeah, in fact, the, the replay's on YouTube up there. I'll um I'll, I'll put up a link for uh for Rudy's uh, YouTube channel here in a little bit. Um, L is calling in. What's that? Oh well, no, Jonathan Carl is your brother. That yes, yes, my 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 uh my famous brother. Um, so you're probably his brother. By the IRS, just like he he is. Right? Yeah, yeah, well, exactly. Yeah. We, we, we're going to have to rename ourselves, I think, change the names. Yeah. He says he misses Spy Magazine. John actually is a Spy oh, Magazine. Okay. Uh, did you ever see Spy, Alan? I did see Spy Magazine, yeah. yeah it, was espionage. it was, you know, very satirical, very wicked. I mean, yeah. they I, I didn't write anything about Donald Trump at the time, but every time he was referred to in the magazine, he was referred to as thick-fingered grabarian Donald Trump. So, wow. Maybe political. I'm just saying that's how spy. It was a very sarcastic, very yeah, satire. It was a lot of satire, right? Yeah. Huge until a recession yeah. hit and they, you know, lost money. But anyway, it was. Hey, listen. Was well, yeah. Now, um, well, we, we'll get more into that. But I understand it's about, you know, you're in Minneapolis, St. Paul. It's about, what is it? It's five o'clock there. What do you usually do around five o'clock? Don't you? Isn't it time to get something to drink? No. Well, I'm, I did. You suggested I bring some wine because I know you like to open wine. So I did. Yes. No, I'm not normally drinking at 5 p.m. I'm usually still working. And I also, I'm not a native. I'm a I'm an army brat. I lived everywhere and nowhere. But I, I say I'm from Washington, D.C. because I went to junior high school and high school there. And after four years in college, went there and started at the Post and lived there professionally for 40 years till I met a woman at an L.A. dinner party. I've been trying to move to L.A. forever. And I thought, well, this, you know, this could happen. 
And I, yeah. and, she, and she said, and we were getting along famously. And she said, well, I'm not exactly from Los Angeles. So I'm thinking how bad could Santa Barbara be? Even San Diego or even where you live, you know? Yeah. And I said, well, where exactly? And she said, White Bear Lake, Minnesota, which is a suburb of St. Paul, which I didn't know, of course. I said, <laughs> really sounds cold. She said, oh, it is. And I thought, well, this is not happening. And, you know, six months later, we started dating. A year later, I moved here. We broke up nine years ago. She hated Minnesota. She hated Minnesota. <laughs> and I thought, I moved. I'm an army brat. I can live anywhere. But she really wanted to move to Southern California. So I said, great. Your kids finish high school. We go to Southern California. Well, by that time, real estate values had gone down. We had an expensive loft. And then by the time that was ready to move, uh, she met some other guy and she broke up and she now lives in Napa. And I'm still in St. Paul going, I, how did that happen? Yeah, this doesn't make sense. And you guys probably, did you ever see the white bear? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, there's a car dealership, white bear Ford or something. And there's a bear the size, you know, the size of the Statue of Liberty out front. So yeah, yeah. I've seen that white bear. I don't think there are any other white bears around there. So anyway, yeah. I live in the now 20 years in Minneapolis, St. Paul. Don't ask me how that happened, but here I am. But there you are. Well, what are, we, what are you drinking then? I, I, we, you know, the deal joke is it's five o'clock somewhere, so that's why I brought right. that up. I mean, five o'clock here in St. Paul. Well, I had a saut uh, I had a sauterne open already. It's not any chem, the queen, the the master of all. But it's uh, from Chateau Soudiaure. I don't know how to pronounce French. It's very famous. S u d u i r a u t. Somebody there can start. Yeah, yeah. Should, uh, well, I'm, I'm my, my my French is you know if we can. And Americans, that. it might seem strange to Americans. I'm drinking at five o'clock, but in France, people drink sauternes before dinner to create it. They say to set their taste buds up and get their appetite going. Normally, we when we do serve sauternes, which is not often in America, it's people oh, it's so sweet. Um, normally, it's served after dinner as an after dinner drink in the states, but in Europe, they drink it all, a lot before dinner. So we'll pretend like uh, I'm at my daughter's house below Bordeaux and that we're doing this before dinner. What do you got? Well, I'm going to also with French, you know, the Sauternes from France. I've got a Sancerre from uh, mm -hmm. Le Charme. Lovely. And um, I, it's the first time I've producers draw uh, domain Andre Vatan. And uh, I just thought, because it's, you know, it's still, it's, 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 it's pretty hot today. The sun is out and a nice crisp Sauternes might, might be just the right thing to, uh, to sip while I'm hanging out with Rudy. Um, so... Okay, let me get that up here. I got a my cat is sitting right next to me, and he's uh, very, 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 very happy. Here you go, Rudy. Good here. to see you. Thanks for being on Journeys. Nice to be here. Thank you. What's the cat drinking? Uh, the cat is definitely drinking up a lot of uh, Z's snoozing. That's um, what cats do. Yeah, that's yeah. exactly what they do. Ooh, good. Mm, yeah. Let's like see. Fiber, you know. Oh. Now, Ajay in India says it's um, 3, 3.43. It's almost 4 a.m. in India right now. And so it's uh, I'm not, tonight or he wouldn't be on. He wouldn't uh, have the presence of mind to tune in. Yeah. <laughs> you, Ajay. You're, you're, you're a soldier, Ajay. You're a trooper. Yeah, yeah. It's awesome. Awesome to see him. He joined us, I think, uh, the first time he came on was during the Leon Logothetis. Uh, he had actually, when Leon was filming his TV show, Ajay met him um, you know, on the streets of wherever, wherever in India he was from, he could probably chime in there. But, you know, thinking about places like India, thinking about France, um, travel, travel is going to be a little bit different once things are opened up. Now, well, different. I, I, I mean, you know, right now we are on everybody's don't invite them list as Americans. Nobody wants yeah. us to come. And then, yeah, I look, you look at the numbers of, you know, people testing positive here and people who have passed away here. And it's no wonder nobody wants us to drop in. So that's the first hurdle is getting someone to accept us. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Get him. Get, you know, I mean, I, I see just in, you know, in some of my notes, um, I got an email from Aegean airlines, uh, last two weeks ago saying they were open up and they listed on this long email, 29 countries that were, uh, they were open to having. And of course the U S wasn't on that list. And, um, and I know in France, they are, they are debating a, uh, a bill in their, uh, in their legislature that would require anybody coming there from, uh, outside a mandatory 14 day quarantine. And, and the UK right now actually has a 14, um, mandatory, you know, so maybe maybe the well, question well, before, before you change it, before you ask that question, last week the the, the 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 minister of tourism from Thailand said they may not allow Europeans and Americans into the country till mid 2021. And 
Europeans and particularly Americans are a really important source of revenue for Thailand at, for tourism. I'm very surprised. We'll see. It wasn't official, but I mean, mid 2021, come on. Mid 2021, yeah. yeah. You know, and it's not, it, it, it's like everybody here, you know, when, when people get into that whining and complaining mode, and I get it. But I always say complaining is draining how how we were locked down and people were not able to, you know, go out. Who hurt the most? Of course, it's the small businesses because it's a economy is a multifaceted with lots of gears and everything makes everything else move. Right. And, in, and and you think about in Thailand where, um, you know, I, I'm not sure what kind of stimulus programs the government could do if it would at all for its um, I think they sent a thousand dollars. I think they sent a thousand dollars to everybody. Which Did was, they? Me, a thousand bucks in Thailand means a lot more than a thousand bucks in America, too. By the way. Oh yeah, absolutely, absolutely. That's why a lot of Americans like to go there because it, sure. the money goes far, right? Right. Um, you know, Italy. We're not allowed in Italy right, right. now. Uh, I'm trying to think. Uh, let's see. So, so maybe the question, Rudy, is, and this is this is something I bring to you is is the question isn't maybe where we're going to go but maybe when we should go and, and, and beyond the fact that when they'll let us go, when do you think it's going to be, you know, in, in your Rudy Maxwell world crystal ball, what do you think? Boy, I've got a foggy, a hazy crystal ball. I don't know. I, I'm hoping like maybe early in August, but our death rate keeps going up. It doesn't, it's not a compelling reason to invite Americans over. Um, you know, maybe they're going to say, okay, but you can come over if you have, you know, within four days before your departure, you had a test showing you're negative or, asymptomatic or whatever. I don't know. I mean, I think there's going to be a hodgepodge of rules for countries all over the world. You know, two weeks quarantine or no quarantine or a proven test. It's it's going to be a mess. I mean, that's what U.S. airlines don't know where to start their international flights or when or where to go to or when they can go to. So. Yeah. Do you think that it's going to come down to something like I, um, you've traveled through Africa, I'm sure. And mm -hmm. You know, when I went to certain, there's certain countries in Africa and I believe in South America where it's mandatory that uh, at the border you show them a card, a yellow fever card. It's probably the most um, prior to COVID-19, the most, um, you know, worried about virus, at least in those areas where where it's a, a, a potential flare up. And I remember as an army brat as a kid, I had to care. I still had my cards. I mean, you, you had to show those in you, anywhere you went in the old days, including Europe. Yeah. Is that going to be, are we going to have them on our phones now? And that's going to be a QR code and going to, you know, we're, we're proof that we, if there, I mean, what, will there be a vaccine? Yeah. I, I, I think there'll be a vaccine, I hope. Um, but I think, I think that would be the way to go. Yeah. To have something proving that you've had it a shot or had the vaccine or whatever. Yeah. I, it, no one knows. I mean, look, all these countries change these rules every week. You know, Spain yeah. wasn't going to open up until, you know, October. Now they're opening up to everybody in Europe. And I mean, the rules keep changing all the time. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And and then then airlines are getting, um, you know, we've seen the, the the news has been blanketed with, of course, those crowded flights. But, um, you know, I saw an article regarding the the uh, Airlines for America. You know, it's that uh, conglomerate Lobby. or the consortium for, you know, I think, uh, Let's see who's on the list. I wrote them down. Alaska, American Delta, oh, Hawaiian, right. Jet Blues, just all of them. They all Northern now work for Amer airlines, you know. Yeah, right. Yeah. So they've they've um they've been more articulate in their uh, face covering policy and in their communications and they are going to um you know, when you go through your check-in process, they're going to ask that question. Uh you know, are you going to well, uh, today? Uh, excuse me for, for inter interrupting. I yeah. saw today that uh, that's what happens when you have a host on, he interrupts you there. Um <laughs> I, I saw today that, that uh, Airlines for America are asking the transportation secretary to mandate the wearing of masks in airports and airplanes. Because right now it's just like when we started with this with the state. So everybody just do what you need to do locally, you know. And so airlines don't feel emboldened enough to force you to wear, you know, to compel you to wear a mask. Although some say, you know, you're not taking off without it. But in airports, nobody is required to unless a local. Anyway. The point is they would like the government to say, here's the deal. You're in an airport, yeah. you wear a mask. You're in an airplane, you wear a mask. That's a Department of Transportation rule. Thank you very much. Well, and with this administration, I doubt that's going to happen. Um, know. You know, we could get John on uh, on that one. But I um, I know just, just yesterday or day before, the uh, CEO of Delta was interviewed, and he said that they are not going to force people off the plane if they take off their mask. So, you, right. you know, it's right. it, it's it, it's crazy. Um 
the in, in as we're talking about airlines you know and the the, the complexion of the uh, air industry is going to change quite a bit but i don't know if you noticed uh last week that uh, american air, i mean um, united airlines had uh, gone through its earnings call right cuz publicly held company and uh they they announced that their burn rate you know there's their daily burn rate used to be 40 million dollars a day and now it's only now it's only 30 million 30, right. but they also said that they were able to secure a loan of 5 billion dollars and they uh, secured it to their loyalty program right and american airlines they- is trying to do the same right now too those miles are such an important source of revenue now for airlines if they could shut down the airlines and, and just sell miles which of course would wouldn't be useful Right. Uh, they, they would like to do that. I remember, I think it was Robert Crandall from American Airlines when he was CEO of it years ago, and, and the airlines were all losing money too. He said, if we could just su- shut down the airline, just publish our American Airlines magazine, we'd make money. <laughs> uh, well, he, it's it's interesting because um, in, in many cases, you may remember um, you know, our, our nearby neighbors in Canada, uh, C- Canadian uh, Air Canada, spun off its frequent flyer program, and it's now called Aeroplan, and it's a 100% different entity. Um, is it possible that, and, and back in the day with Crandall was, you remember before we had um, our own internet terminals, we could book our own airlines, there was the Sabre system um, yeah. from American oh, yeah. Airlines, and they spun that off because it can't, became a standard for 20 years in right. the uh, in the airline industry. Are we going to see this as a possible? Um... I don't think so because they're so valuable to the airlines. I don't know that they want to sell it because they can, it can go on for decades. I mean, they make so much money selling their, those miles to, uh, you know, whether it's your local car wash, it gives you 500 miles if you use it or, you know, 10,000 miles for shopping you know, to, to a credit card, a hundred thousand miles if you sign up for, you know, an America's Best Platinum card or whatever the offer is that month. They make so much money selling those those miles to, to businesses. I don't, I, I'm sure they could get a big payoff if they decide to sell it like Aeroplan, but I have a hunch that, you know, they, they want to hold on to it, but they're yeah. borrowing against it, you know. And I know a couple of uh, credit card companies like Chase, which issues, uh, I guess, United's card, I think. Um, I can't remember who issues American, but anyway, I know they pre-sold for billions of dollars, a whole bunch of miles to their credit card companies just to stay afloat. The airlines did. Yeah. Wow. That's, that's fascinating. Um, How is it going to be? Yeah. Let's, let's let's imagine a post pandemic uh, world, even, even right now. I mean, I, one of the uh, L just said she met a woman with a dog traveling uh, uh, to her second home in Vienna from Miami. She said she had no requirements to leave the U.S., but she will be tested upon uh, COVID-19 on landing in Europe. So um, maybe they're- yeah, You can leave the United States. <laughs> it's just how you're going to be greeted when you arrive at your destination. Yeah. Um, and, you know, Austria had really brought the smackdown on COVID-19 early on and have had a, you know, a very good record. I mean, the number of deaths is minuscule, minuscule compared to the United States, compared to a lot of yeah. countries. And uh, so they are opening up. I, I didn't know that they were welcoming Americans with simply a test when you arrive. That's pretty nice. Yeah. Well, and and there there have been, you know, those pockets of, uh, of country. Greece did really well as well um, in in terms of that. And we, my guest last week was from the country of Georgia. Um, you know, oh, the yeah, they, did well they did very well as well. Um, so so this, you know, what what does airport entry a tsa experience look like here in if if it's august as you say rudy what what can we expect for, at airports for domestic yes for, for domestic flights here in the u.s well i don't know i flew two weekends ago i think from minneapolis st paul to chicago and it was same as it ever was there was nothing different at all uh and there was debate about every airport taking temperatures and some airports were complaining or the TSA, somebody was complaining about there was not enough money to buy all the equipment. I, I don't know, except the fact that we boarded, you know, back of the plane first to the front of the plane instead of the other way around. Uh, there was really, and you know, middle seats in some cases kept empty in some airlines like American for a while anyway. 
till the end of July. Um, other than that, nothing was nothing was any different. Uh, that may change soon enough, obviously, because it changes. As I say, the rules keep changing for travel in almost, on almost every front. Yeah. Um, if you just joined us and you're just tuning in, uh, I am Alan Carl, your host of Journey's Webcast. My guest is Rudy Maxa, the legendary host of Rudy Maxa's World, the savvy traveler in the old days. And uh, um, One uh, thing that we didn't talk about, Indonesia, interestingly enough, presuming you can still hear me, Indonesia is debating whether to charge everybody who comes into their country $3,000 on their credit card as soon as they land. Why is that? Well, they say... We're going to give you a test, and if you test positive, you're going to have to quarantine for two weeks. We will tell you what hotel to stay in, and we'll pay your hotel bills. This is to make sure you pay your hotel bill, pay your medical bills, pay for the test we're giving you when you arrive at the airport that turns you up positive. What's not clear is how you get your $3,000 back or $2,700 after the test. The tests are 100 bucks. So uh, I think Indonesia is not going to be on high on anybody's hit list for visiting um, right now. This I, is the Rudy Mac self. You know, I was just thinking. Alan anymore. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, it's really cool. I noticed that just uh, most 90% of, of, of our attendees here today have, have been in a Journeys webcast before. So um, thank you for uh, for your loyalty as we talk about, um, you know, loyalty. And you've been on my show too. You talked about your brother. You were on my one of my earlier shows, thank goodness. That's right, with uh, Mr. McCarthy, the legend. And McCarthy, the actor, yeah, and, and yeah. travel writer. Yeah, yeah, exactly. He's good looking. He's an actor and he's a travel writer and book author about travel. I, I yeah. just, that's too much. You know, when he, you know, I knew him as an actor. We had mutual friends. So I'd known him for a long time. And then he started writing for National Geographic Travel, wrote a travel book. And I called him up and said, listen, I, I, I didn't come out to Hollywood and, and, and mow your lawn or mow your grass and try to be an actor. What are you doing in my backyard? <laughs> it was a really fun interview because remember it was three of us on, which is, that's right. Which that's is, right. um, yeah, unusual. I, yeah, I I just put up another poll. I'm curious of of those who who are joining us today if you've seen or heard of uh, Rudy Max either radio or TV show. So I put some of his. <laughs> oh, um, I better vote in the poll. You better vote in the poll. <laughs> yes, love this guy. Oh, I, I can't. I'm not allowed to vote. No, that's pretty clever. Uh, oh, they don't let you vote. Yeah, you can't stock the deck. I see yeah. how it is. Okay. So Rudy, there was a there was a uh, uh, an article in the USA Today this weekend by Mitch Album. You know, um, did you see yeah. this uh, no. talking about travel and the fact that yeah, we're not being able, we're not uh, we're persona non grata and in in uh, non grata in the uh, in the European and the outside Thailand world, uh, right. Indonesian world, uh, wherever. Um, right. And and this article kind of wrote in that there's a huge there's an RV boom. So is yes. is is 2020 the year of travel? Are are we? Yeah. Do we have to do we have to turn inward and 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 maybe we, have ourselves a bit of a um a reflection and, and and explore our own backyard? I think it's definitely going to be a driving season. Um, I had a guest on uh, on the radio show last weekend uh, who wrote a piece for the New York Times on the. Uh, the the turn toward long term vacation home rentals, all these uh, these realtors who handle vacation homes, you know, in the outer banks and everywhere, they're used to people renting for the weekend or maybe for a week, maybe two weeks. Now people are saying it's rent for two months. Why does why stay in my crummy little well not crummy my little tiny apartment in Brooklyn? Let's go to the outer banks. Let's go to Florida. Let's go to Southern California. Rent a place for two weeks. So you're seeing, I think, a lot of domestic car travel. And let's just stay in a house. I don't particularly want to stay in a different hotel room every night. Uh, that sort of thing. So, yeah, I think there's a lot of turning inward and a lot of domestic travel, um, more than we've ever seen. More people driving, which the airlines yeah. don't like to hear, of course. And then these long-term rentals with people saying, why just rent it for a week? Let's stay there and uh, make it our house for a couple months. Yeah, and and with – and. And long term, also in the in the RV, because now you have mm -hmm. control of your environment. You know, you your bed, you that you don't want to go to the, maybe you don't want to go into a hotel room. Um, I, I yeah. hate to say this. I hate to say this because once I do, everybody who's listening is never going to be able to get it out of their mind. But a, uh, a hotelier for a very very luxurious fancy hotel chain once said to me, he "said Rudy, if I took a picture of the last 150 people who stayed in your hotel room, you'd never go in it." <laughs> it's a terrible image, and I can't get it out of my mind since he told me that like 20 years ago. 
I mean, I, I remember people back in, you know, 10, 15 years ago, they say, you know, if you take a certain kind of light, like a black light, and you go oh. over your, your your linens, you would be you would be well frightened to death. Yeah. Particularly bedspreads or, or or duvets or whatever that aren't cleaned regularly. Yeah. Yeah. Local news stations used to do that during rating season to get ratings. They go uh. with, with black lights into hotel rooms and go, look at this this this, you know, hotel room two blocks from my studio. You know, and it's, and it, uh, I know, but I mean, there are germs everywhere. There are germs, you know, I'm sure if you brought a black light into my apartment, I live alone. I'm sure you'd find, you know, schmutz here and black light stuff there. We're, our bodies are covered with germs, for God's sakes. I mean, millions of them. You know, this laptop in front of me is. So I think we have to make peace with, with most germs, like 99% of them, except for the COVID-19 germ. Um, yeah, you know, yeah. And yeah, okay, fine. And, and I, one of the things I, 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 I traveled and filmed uh, one of my episodes of my TV show in China a couple of years ago. Mm-hmm. And yeah, you know, there we were on very low budget. I mean, this was a, a very, you know, bootstrapped experience. We wanted to get some really cool stuff. Plus we wanted to see parts of China that maybe we're either not supposed to see or certainly not supposed to film. But my, I had a very young crew uh, that had, very little experience in travel, but very young and willing and excited about travel as we all are, especially at that age. And two of them got sick, you know, and I'm, I'm, you know, I've been to now whatever it is, 80 some odd countries. Um, and, and one thing I think about being traveling about, uh, about traveling and about being more open and, um, and not so concerned. Um, I, I don't, I've never until this COVID thing, never really ever used hand sanitizer. I hated the feel. I hated how it dried me out. So I was never one of these kinds of guys with the Purell in the bottom of my pannier or in the car or whatever, because what that does is it impacts your immunity, you know, and the more you travel, the more you're out there, your immunity gets built up. And there is a bit of fear that are we in, in this, you know, I mean, this, no, no question. This is the most contagious virus I think that the world's ever seen. I mean, that, that, that's for debating, but it's certainly in the top five. Sure. Are we going to come out of this less immune or more immune? More or more. I think. I mean, I, you know, I, I rarely get sick. And, and and growing up as an army brat, we lived in Europe two times. Lived everywhere: Huntsville, Alabama, Heidelberg, Germany, all around. <clears throat> and the colonel made sure that I ate every piece of food on my plate all the time because early in my, when I was a little boy, we once went to England after the war, World War II. And, and I guess I turned up my nose at something on the plate and boy, did I get reamed out by the Colonel after we left the house saying, you know, they were really hit hard during World War II and they spent a lot of money for that food you ate today. Or you were supposed to eat tonight. And for you to say, Oh, I don't like that. You never say that again. And I never did. I had to eat everything on my plate, no matter what. So as not to insult anybody or, Anyway, I had to do it all the time. So what and was the thing what was the thing that made you gag? I don't I don't remember what it was. it was. I was very young, very very young, but I'll never forget it and and so very at my I was married once for 15 years my wife and subsequent girlfriends have all said how come you never they well one couple of girlfriends said you never get sick because you traveled all over the world, you ate everything, you know, at, at roadside stands in Germany and you know markets and everywhere in Asia and you never get sick because you've been exposed to all these different kinds of germs. I have no idea whether that has any basis in scientific fact or not, or I'm just lucky. But uh, I just just don't get sick so far. You know, yeah. Watch, I'll get COVID nineteen tomorrow night. You know, but uh, <laughs> I hope not. Yeah. I'm old. I'm old. I, I tell my daughter in France in the beginning of this. I said they're knocking off grandpas all over the United States. Right here. <laughs> well, uh, today, but I'm a grandpa, so it's pretty. <laughs> nice. <laughs> there you go. Well, well, Elle is saying the wine is wine glass is half full, Rudy. She says that uh, she's an Air Force brat who ate dirt as a kid. <laughs> yeah, yeah, kid, yeah. And we played in it. You know, we all played in it. Played in sandboxes where probably dogs had peed. I mean, it's all around us. So I, I, I don't mean to scare anybody with that ho- that terrible hotel thing I planted in your mind. You'll never be able to get out of your mind. So yeah, uh, well, you know. But- Michael brings up a, a um, interesting concept of travel insurance. Now, I've never really been one of those guys who bought the travel insurance that they always force you to say no right. to. Yeah, um, but I do have MedJet Assist. It's a medical evacuation. You know, I travel by motorcycle largely when I'm traveling around the world, and you know, all I got to do is have one bozo in a car, you know, make a wrong move, and I could right. be flat right. out. Yeah, and um, but so I, I I buy MedJet Assist, which is essentially if I am a, if I have a problem in a country. And by the way, 
in Bolivia, in Bolivia, I broke my leg horribly in three places in the middle of nowhere in the Altiplano of, um, oh, maybe this is a time I could, I could pitch my book. I don't ever do that. You know, it's funny. I've never really, you know, but the story's in my book. Oh, book. Oh. Wait, while you pitch your book, <laughs> your it's book right, it, right here on my coffee table, if you don't have it handy. Okay, look at that. See, this is what I love about Rudy, man. He is he is a he's a forks reader. But I anyway, I got I did use that Medjet Medjet evacuation insurance. They got me out of there. Although it took 24 hours, three flights, and um, a lot of hell. But I did get out of Bolivia. Oh, you know. Let, let me say something about that. First of all, you you have to require hospitalization for them to fly you out. Um, you know, if you get just sick there, and they can take care of you locally. But well, first of all. This question about travel insurance, Michael, first of all, the one we always reject is the one where you're insuring your one flight that you're not going to die. You know, forget that. But there's so many different kinds of travel insurance. And MedJet Assist was one of the underwriters in my public television shows. So we all had met. And I remember the very first shoot I was ever on. This was before I owned the shows. Small World Productions had done five seasons of Rick Steves. Rick had gone off on his own. They said, would you come on and do... We, you know, we want to do something more upscale with food and wine, blah, blah, blah. Would you be interested? In you know, sure. I mean, his face is made for TV, obviously. Um, at a high definition, no less. Oh, God. Anyway, so we're in. So I had MedJet Assist because I knew this president at the time and he had covered he, and I was covered. And so we're in, we're in our first shoot in Venice. And I say to the guy who runs the company, Small World Productions, I says, do, do we have insurance, medical evacuation insurance for the, uh, the crew? He said, oh, yeah, I got it on my credit card. And many people do have medical evacuation insurance on premium credit cards, like the Amex Platinum card. But yeah. if you read the small print, which nobody ever reads, it's medical evacuation to the nearest medical facility, which could be 10 blocks away from where something happens. So we shot a week in Venice. We then go to Rome for a week to shoot. And my friend John, who ran the company, who I'd asked that question to, for some reason, leaves leaves where we're shooting and goes over to the Roman Colosseum, the Colosseum in Rome, and it's a sunny day, dry, and somehow he slips on the stones, and he's a big guy, and you know breaks his right something I don't know something in his right shoulder. They rush him to a hospital. The place is filthy, and he calls his credit card company. They said, "Well, you're at a hospital. We, you know, we'll pay for your cab fare from the Colosseum to the hospital. Just send us that receipt." And it was one of those rare times where you get to say, "Told you so. Told you so." And from then on, we got MedJet Assist for the whole crew. In fact, if you go to MedJetAssist.com and buy anything on the phone or online, if you put in my last name, you'll get 10% off, M-A-X-A, because they were hey. corporate underwriters. So, oh, very cool. Awesome. Even though they, I haven't had a business relationship, but my friends all go and say, I got 10% off. I give them your last name. So, you know, that's uh, about well, there's a be to our viewers today so there's a tip you know one of the things i'm on their motorcycle policy by the way i just got a renewal notice and i thought to myself you know what i don't think i'm going anywhere i'm not going to renew right now but they will they will certainly return you anywhere in the u.s but yeah, in if the, you require if, hospitalization they will and they help it, you and i broke a shoulder in uzbekistan i'm sorry to interrupt him yeah uh you know I, I was throwing off a camel in uzbekistan had a broken shoulder and uh they wanted to operate in this small town called hiva k-h-i-v-a i know you know and uh, we called MedJet Assist, and they got a University of Pittsburgh bone specialist. He said, whatever you do, don't operate. Broken shoulder blades, or clavicles, I should say, heal themselves. I didn't know that. Because yeah. the doctor in Hiva said, oh, we must operate now, or, or, or one of your bone chips will cut your carotid artery, and you will bleed out and die. And I was going, operate. And the MedJet guy said, do not operate. Whatever you do, put your arm in a sling. It'll grow back. And, in fact, it did. Yeah. And yeah. They, 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 yeah when I had the MedJet provided the doctor the connection instantly. And so MedJet Assist was very helpful to me in that case. Yeah, no, they're, they're they are fantastic. In fact, I had uh, uh, they they after my experience in in Bolivia, um, they put their PR team on me, and uh, and there were articles about my experience oh. with, from uh, from the MedJet perspective. Yeah, oh, good. for good. sure. But um, in the in the case like in the in, oh, this happens only in the U.S. If I crash my motorcycle in Bolivia, they'll get me back, but they don't. The motorcycle is not part of the deal, but in the U.S., if I'm cruising the the the, the Blue Ridge Parkway and uh, you know and Virginia. crash, oh, they'll yeah. they'll send the bike back to to San Diego as well. That's part of the policy. Really? So yeah, really? for domestic. For yeah, if you so you got to get the motorcycle little add on. It's a little extra cash, but um, yeah, I, I do. Did do not that. know that. Oh, that's good to know. I don't yeah. ride motorcycles, but uh, good yeah, to know. That, yeah. So um, what? Um, 
what I wanted to to here, I'm gonna just, I mean, I mean, you know, this is the um, only time I've done this. Okay, on this, this there is for the book, a very handsome forks. book. It's now in a soft cover. Look at this. This is like just off, hot off the press. It's in its fourth printing. It was sold out for about four months. Um, now what I did is I decided to do. There's still hard covers available. I'm gonna put a link to the to the Amazon page in the um in the sidebar. But that's what a great. I mean, Father's oh, Day just it? passed, but. Oh, what uh, Tell them what the book's about. Sell it. So, okay. So it's, it's, this is, I, you know, for those of you who don't know who I am, I am um, Alan Carl, obviously. And I spent three years of my life traveling around the world on a motorcycle continuously, except for that broken leg in Bolivia that we're talking about. And when I returned home, I wrote a book instead of doing just a travelogue memoir about this is me, 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 me. I decided to go ahead and share it in stories from five different continents, 35 different countries. Every country is represented by photos, a story usually connecting with people. But here's the, the coup d'etat, as they would say. Every country has a recipe or two mm. of the real food, the local stuff. And they're not hard to cook. They're All the ingredients are easily available. And it's a beautiful visual coffee table book. Um, from all over the world. I continue to travel the world. I'm now, this was 35 countries in here. I've now been to uh, more than 75 on a motorcycle, 81, you know, cause sometimes I do take the plane. Um, so that's Forks, check it out, man. It's, uh, it's I'm pretty Rudy cool. Max and I endorse that message. <laughs> okay, good. Hey, I, speaking of Rudy Max, I wanna just play, you know, you've been, um, Rudy Max is how many countries have you filmed in? I don't know. We used to have it on some promotional postcard we handed out. I don't know. For, uh, I don't know. 35? A lot. I don't know. I don't know. I, I want to show um, um, uh, just a, a little teaser of, because yeah, I'm a food guy. We just talked about recipes. This is, uh, you've been traveling the last couple of years doing a lot of stuff in Asia. You kind of focus. You've done a whole ton of Europe. So this, let's watch this and we'll talk about it on the back end. Hi, I'm Rudy Maxson. Please join me and my good friend, restaurant tour Daisuke Hi, Ikegawa, I'm Rudy Maxson. for a Please. culinary tour of Japan. We unravel the secrets of sushi in Tokyo. Oh, 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 look at that. Slam down bowls of ramen and plates of fresh scallops on the snowy island of Hokkaido. And finally, we travel to the island of Kyushu, where we discover the special ingredient in Japanese stock and taste the finest beef in the world. Ah, food. Uh, Rudy, your uh, your your audio. You probably need to click it on and off again. Your microphone. Right. Sorry, I was just saying food, and it's almost six o'clock here. It makes me hungry looking at that. So. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, what's it like cruising in this? You know, in the past couple of years, you've done a lot of stuff in in Asia. What what's impressed you, and what has scared you? Well, nothing scared me because. You know, I, I had an apartment in Bangkok for 28 years, so I spent a lot of time in Asia. I um, I don't think anything's ever scared me in Asia. I, I don't think. Oh, I, well, I do remember back in the days when you could ride elephants in Thailand. It's politically incorrect now. But at the Four Seasons uh, Resort and Elephant Preserve outside of Chiang Rai in northern Thailand, I got on an elephant, which is uh, an inelegant process that unfortunately was filmed and actually put on TV. Um, and I was with uh, another elephant, uh, you know, a professional rider, and uh, the Mahout and his elephant. And we went into the water, and I didn't know it, but my producer did, that the Mahout was going to tell my elephant to take me underwater. I mean, already it was enough <laughs> to waste in the water, but then I suddenly went underwater. The elephant, like, got down on its, I don't know, hind legs or something underwater. And I'm like, thank goodness I grabbed some air before I went under. That did you have your seatbelt on? <laughs> I didn't have my seatbelt on. <laughs> That's the scariest thing in Asia. I mean, the scariest incident was getting thrown off that... Uh, a uh, camel in um, Uzbekistan. Uzbekistan. Um, wow. because, because I was knocked out and we actually have it on film and, and my producer thought she'd killed me that I was dead because it, I fell on a cobblestone street with my head and, and I had no saddle, nothing to hold on to. It was stupid that we were on it. Stupid. Yeah. The guy who owned the camel told us not to do it and we offered him a month's salary of $50 and uh, he went, mm, okay. Uh, you know, one thing, yeah. uh, I, I, I rode a camel a couple times. I did one in... Um, I hate it. In, in I Sinai. Before. I've ridden it before, but this was the last time. Oh, it's the most uncomfortable thing. I was in, in Sinai. I was trying to get up to 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 see where uh 
uh, you know, Moses and the, where the, 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 the tablets, the, the, the commandments came were, came down. yeah, right. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, 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 it's interesting. So nothing, nothing is, is really scared. You. You're doing great work. I, I'd like to, what you, you mentioned there, you know, it's not really politically correct anymore to be on an elephant. I want to no. play it. I want to play a little video here and I want to come back and talk about how tourism and I, and I hate the word tourism, by the way, because I, I consider myself a traveler yeah. and not a tourist. And, uh, you know, our great Paul Theroux is a, um, a great writer who does a, a thing. But for me, my personal definition, uh, um, um, a tourist follows itineraries and a traveler follows his or her dreams. Um, okay. So, but sometimes travel has different motivations for people. Let's watch this. This is just was from last week in the news. The story of adventurer Christopher McCandles has inspired people to find themselves in the wilderness for more than two decades. But the wrecked bus made famous by the 1996 book and 2007 movie Into the Wild, based on his life, was airlifted from a remote trail outside Denali National Park in Alaska on Thursday. Alaska officials said that too many people were putting themselves at risk trekking to the remote site where McCandles died of starvation in 1992. Over the years, several people making pilgrimages to the bus became injured or stranded themselves. Two even died, drowned in river crossings. In April, a stranded Brazilian tourist was evacuated and in February, five Italian tourists were rescued. Local Mayor Clay Walker called the bus removal a big relief. The ultimate fate of the 1940s era bus is unknown. In a statement, the Department of Natural Resources said it is being kept in a secure location, pending a decision about its disposal. Well, I, I in, didn't know anything about that. My goodness. This was just last week, which is weird, right in the middle of the pandemic. Yeah. Um, so for those who don't know the story, uh, John Krakow wrote a, a great book, Into the Wild, which was made into a movie about a, uh, a young lad from Maryland, actually, you know, mm -hmm. outside D.C., who through a pilgrimage across the country and eventually led to Alaska, he just wanted to live by himself. Um, and he did live in that bus. And um, the sad fate of him is that uh, in the wintertime, he was unable to, uh, the rivers got too big and he couldn't there and he died there. And that's uh, into the wild. But what the point of the story is, of course, how tourism is, uh, you know, I was in Dubrovnik last year. And um, most of the people that are going to Dubrovnik aren't worried, aren't curious about the history of the um, of the actual Italian heritage people that lived there and how that was an independent little country, little state from the rest of the, the Balkans and from the Ottoman empire at the time. And actually the Ottomans worked a deal with the Dubrov, the, 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 uh, and I, I can't remember what the kingdom was called, but nonetheless, but people go to Dubrovnik now cruise ships in there. It's madness. It is absolutely madness because the game of Thrones was filmed there. So as we see with people making a pilgrimage because they're fascinated about a kid, that, actually about a movie about a kid, um, and in this in this selfie-induced Instagram world, tourism has gotten a little bit crazy. What do you, do you think that we're in for a correction? Well, the people of Barcelona and Venice uh, certainly hope we are, um, the residents, I should say. I don't know. You know, you touched on the selfie thing and this this desire from some folks to have the most edgy picture on Instagram or elsewhere, Facebook, whatever, uh, has led to dozens of deaths around the world. People getting a little too close to the cliff and taking one step back. And that's the last we ever heard of them. Mm -hmm. uh, as far as I know exactly what you mean. I mean, I, I tell everything, anybody who goes to Dubrovnik, do not go there during the day because that's when the cruise ship people come out and then they have to go back on the ship, fortunately. And uh, so I take friends there in the evening yes. uh, when you can actually walk down the, the, the main streets without uh, you know, jostling people's shoulders. Uh, I hope so. I mean, the, all these places, Dubrovnik's now, you know, Dubrovnik, you can't go up and walk around the uh, ramparts of the city unless you buy a pretty expensive ticket now. Not yeah. really expensive, but you, you know, if you're on a budget, you think about it. Um, how in Venice, you know, keeps playing with charging everybody $4. They do actually, I think through their hotel tax, 
but and but I don't think Barcelona's figured it out. They keep saying we're going to limit the number of visitors to the city, and you go, well, how, how are you going to do that? I mean, yeah, how do you do that? I mean, it's not like there's two roads leading into Barcelona, and you can put up a gate. Um, I don't know. I don't know how you do it, and I, I think for a while, because of COVID nineteen, there's going to be fewer people in these cities. I mean, we've talked about the airline industry, but I feel even more sorry, sort of, for the cruise ship industry. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So they, they don't, you know, airlines have some planes flying and they keep adding more each month. You know, the cruise ships keep pushing back their start dates now. It used to be July, mid July. Now it's, I don't know, October, I think, for yeah. some. Uh, uh, so uh, uh, people traveling. So maybe Barcelona and Venice and Dubrovnik will, will have lighter touch of tourism for a while. Uh, how long that'll last? Who knows? Let's watch this little uh, video I threw together, which kind of, and, and by the way, Venice and, and um, Barcelona, as well as other places are featured here. So check this out. Over tourism. Oh my uh, gosh! The shot of uh, uh, real, oh the, the the Great Wall of China, and uh, then there's a real quick shot of that bridge to that little pagoda or whatever it is in the center yes. of Hanoi, in the center of the lake, in the center of town. It's really depressing. I mean, it, it really is. So and the locals, you know, Amsterdam. Uh, uh, I read a piece of I think it was New York Times maybe uh, about the residents of Amsterdam who were sort of reclaiming their city the last three months. Because the whole downtown area, uh, you know, tourist shops, they lost all their local shops. Uh, locals never went to the, to the pharmacies there, to the bakeries there. And people are getting reacquainted with the city and they can walk, you know, their bike paths don't, they don't hit tourists when they're riding their bikes and so on. And they're, 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 they're loving it. Now, I'm sure there's some businesses, tourism shops, and I know there are, that are lamenting lost revenue. But for folks who live there, this over-tourism is a serious problem. It, it, it is. And I, you know, you've obviously experienced it firsthand. I, I really was brushed up against it in, um, in Dubrovnik. Uh, I, you know, I, I, I like to go, you know, as the, the cliche, the road less traveled or the, um, off the beaten track. And, and one of the things I, I try, you know, and when people come to me for advice about travel, where should I go is there are pockets of the world that are, ripe for discovering and and even in this instagram and overly sure blogged about world you can find um somewhere where the two where the locals aren't gonna you know resent you know resent you and uh and that and and for most recently it's been the former yugoslavia and eastern europe you know romania right. bulgaria um and the baltic nations as well yeah 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 exactly serbia and montenegro well montenegro is you know any of those places? Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. Any of those well, places where the Dubrovnik, that you know, you get the overflow there, right? Yeah, Georgia, I mean, where... Georgia earlier. That's I've only been there once uh, for a week, and it's become my favorite new country. Georgia. It's a little hard to get to in the states, but or at least from the Midwest. So. Yeah, no, Georgia is, is really beautiful, and by the way, great wine. Um, you know, yeah. unique what they've done. If you, uh, uh, for those of you on um, on the webcast today or watching this on the replay, go back and watch my interview with Andrew Barnovi. He used to be a governor, minister of defense. He was the uh, Georgia's um, NATO rep. I mean, this guy is like a legend. But he gave up a life in politics to go and make wine. But but they've been making wine there for eight thousand years. Well, Where I learned. Went there. I did a tasting. A, a, a local was kind enough to wire me into a tasting, and they're on the same longitude as uh, Bordeaux, apparently. So they've That's got right. a great ideal climate for it. Yeah. yeah. Um, where else would you, you know, for for people considering, you know, once things open up and maybe there we do have some open arms, where where should somebody go? Where would you 
what's, what's I would go to Prague and get out of Prague. I mean, not that Prague isn't lovely, but uh, I mean, I would go into the countryside of Poland or the Czech Republic. Um, certainly, as I say, Georgia and, 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 and the Caucasus Mountains are like an hour's drive from the capital of Tbilisi. They're very close. I have not gone the other direction, Georgia, to the beaches, but I hear they're wonderful. Mm -hmm. um, Batumi. Go to South Korea and go down to the beaches there. Taiwan is, I think, underappreciated by Americans. Uh, I, you know China better than I do. I've only gone to pretty big cities. I went down to Yangtze a long time ago, but I don't know the smaller towns. Smaller towns in China being only two million people, you know. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. It, it used yeah. to be when, when you look at the list of the most populated cities, you know, there was two or three in in the top ten in China. I think all ten practically in China. I mean, you know, Sao Paulo. Yeah, or, cities that none of us ever heard of. Yeah, a, yeah, exactly. You know, where is yeah. that? What? How many people? <laughs> really, cr really crazy. Where would you? Um, where would you send people? You know, uh, I really, really love Bulgaria and Romania right now. I've not. Um, you've got you've got the 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 Carpathian Mountains, uh, which create. I mean, there's there's actually it's it's a it's a weird mountain range. It creates like a triangle. Um, so that and then the north, close to the Hungarian border. Now remember, in that northern part of of uh, Romania, it used to be part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. So you have hmm. some influence of um, of that, uh, but Cluj Napoca is the capital of Transylvania, and there's a place called Brajov, and it's not far. A lot of people, it's another one of those touristed, over touristed. I actually didn't go, but the Dracula's castle is oh, outside right, of right, Brajov, right. and and there's a lot of other castles, believe me, and monasteries in Romania that will just make your head spin, seriously. Hmm. And there's nobody going there. Um, except maybe local Romanians and, and Serbians um, travel through there as well. And Bulgaria, you know, the Black Sea coast is beautiful, but you go from the, you know, imagine their borders are, are Greece and Turkey to the, you know, to the west and to the south, and certainly Romania and um, and and um, Macedonia up uh, in the in the northwest. But that is an area that. The food is good. The, the hospitality is fantastic. And the countryside, you know, you have those horse-drawn carts. You have people that are – it's just beautiful. And and nobody goes there. I know. I I, I mean, just get out of the big cities. And, and, and the cities are – you know, I love Hong – I love big cities. I love Bangkok. I love Hong Kong. I love Rome and Paris and then Lisbon and you know, all those. But get out of the big cities and, and you just – you know, don't even follow a map. Just drive. Yeah, just drive. Just explore. With real food and real people and – and charming hotels, uh, pretty much all over the world now. So. Yeah, we're we're you know we're coming up. We had a little bit of a hiccup, so I'm going to keep Rudy on just for a few minutes. I just want to put one last poll up there about your biggest concerns about traveling abroad. Made me think of it, and I wanted to ask Rudy because you've been, you know, people look at uh, you. You're a great connector. We've seen you. You're great on camera. You're you're great with people. What is it? What's your magic? What's your secret? You know, because I and, and before you answer that, I I always say this that. When we travel, as a traveler, I love to go to the museums. I love to go to the cathedrals. I love to see the great architecture. I love to see the ruins. But, but it's that espresso or that coffee, the Turkish coffee with the lady on the side of the road in you know, two hours from Istanbul. I'll remember her till the day I leave this planet. Sure. But I can't remember what painting I saw in that particular museum. What's your magic for connecting with people? Well, given how many times I've interrupted you this hour, you probably won't believe it, but I'm a good <laughs> listener. I listen. And I remember when I was a young reporter, right out of college at the Washington Post, uh, some an older reporter, older editor, wiser than I am, I was and probably still am, who said, let silence work for you. Um, you know, people tend, including me and maybe even you, you know, we tend to want to fill in silences. You know, sinuses make us uncomfortable for in a conversation. Um, and it's certainly a technique for investigative reporters. You ask a tough question and they give you a rote answer. And I would count very quietly to myself, 1,000, 2,000, 3,000. And usually by the time I got eight or 9,000, they would blurt out something that they didn't mean to say just to fill in the silence. So that works in investigative reporting, but it works in normal conversation too. If you're sitting with someone who you don't know and you don't try to fill in the silences as soon as they stop talking, they will often disgorge more information and more colorful information 
than they meant to. And I don't mean that in a bad way. They're not telling you any secrets, but they're used to answering that question from tourists. You know, uh, you know, what's the biggest industry here in town? What's the favorite wine? Where do, you know, but if you're just quiet, they will say, they, they may tell you more. In uh, short, yes. listen. Good point. Yeah, you know, and 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 this is actually a great tool. Just yeah, you know, for you know, the hot tip from Rudy, not, not is to is to don't try to fill in the gaps of silence with words. Also them- in in also in negotiation. So if you're trying to negotiate, whether it's a, a a car or a better seat on an airplane, same thing. Just zip the mouth, and yeah, it it is. It's a very good advice. Absolutely, and people love to talk about themselves and, and tell you about the, where they live. Yeah. So if you see somebody sitting alone in a cafe and they're, you know, they're not reading a book, you don't want to interrupt them and just say, you do mind if I sit here and, and, and chat, chat with you? I've never been here before. They're usually delighted to tell you why they like living here or why they hate living there, whatever. Um, yeah. They're delighted to talk to you, you know, and, uh, you know, don't take pictures of anybody without asking permission. But once you, they have given you permission and you take the photo, you've already started a conversation if you want to continue it. This is true. Yeah. Oh, I love, I love those moments where I, I earn their trust and can take, you know, as a, as a guy who always carries a camera and it's a big one, you know, it's not just my phone. Right. Um, I, I, I love that. Um, I, I put up a poll about biggest concerns with traveling abroad. And I, I must say, I love the audience that tunes into journeys because, because instead of terrorism, over tourism and health, petty theft, learning the language or dietary things, now, mo- most people, um, just want to go somewhere, but yes, health safety is, is, is 25% of those of concern. And, and I think in this COVID area, that's certainly justified. Um, well, we have, you have a sophisticated audience. I mean, cause they're not afraid of speaking the language or terrorism as so many people. Yeah. I run, I can't go overseas. I can't go to France. I don't speak French. I go, everybody speaks English. Relax. <laughs> oh no, I don't speak. I can't go. Yeah. Or terrorism. I go, you know, this terrorism in the United States. Remember nine 11, that wasn't very yeah. pretty. Wow, Oklahoma you know, City. We forget, uh-huh. right? We forget we have that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I say, yeah. Would you have gone to the Oklahoma City, you know, the, the building, the day before the bombing or the day of the bombing? If I'd asked you to, if I paid you a thousand dollars to go take something over there, sure. Would you have gone to, you know, the Twin Towers to? If I gave you a coupon for dinner at Windows of the World on the top tomorrow the night before, of course. You know. Yep. Um, yep. So when people tell me about terrorism, I go, you know. It's, you know, it happens. It's reality, but good uh, health, safety and over tourism seem to be the two, two things on the poll. That's that, those are pretty sophisticated answers. And I think health safety would be much less if we were to look at 19. I know it would be. Yeah. And while I've got you uh, on here, uh, or uh, while I've got our, uh, our audience on here, I did put up in the offer area, a link to your uh, YouTube where you can see a lot of your old television shows. You can subscribe to Rudy over there. Um, I do a newsletter. I, you know, I do a weekly newsletter. It's free and it's very, it's not selling anything, even though it's on the Maxitour website. Um, if you'd like to subscribe, it's free. Just go to maxatours.com, maxatours.com, and just scroll all the way down on the homepage and you'll see a place to fill in your name and your email. It only comes once a week. It's very chatty. It's very gossipy. I hope it has useful information. It does. Uh, I, I read it. It always gives good travel information. You are obviously got the pulse on... Um on the travel business and you know so many people your your webcast i was just thinking um has had uh incredible uh list of guests who are always very interesting and uh you will always you always mention in your newsletter your next guest right for that webcast as well yeah i i I keep forgetting i don't i haven't mentioned it i don't think i think maybe once i keep forgetting to mention it yeah well and just scroll down the homepage maxatours.com Maxatours.com. And then, um, and then, then of course, um, you know, the, the, you know, my, um, I'll put up a link to my YouTube page as well. It's, uh, Excellent. It, it, it's, it's, you know, I, it, it's not very consistent, but I've got some really, I've been having a lot of fun because in lockdown, I've been editing some cool videos from footage from last year. I just put up something from Montenegro where I'm dining, you know, I'm, it's got some motorcycle action footage mixed with me rambling about the amazing um clams and lemon and garlic sauce that i'm eating here by these three made by these three brothers like my feet is in the sands of the adriatic it's just cool so anyway you can go check that yeah, out. i got no motorcycle action footage <laughs> no action. so uh
year we're not running any tours except two Christmas tours that are almost sold out. They're very small group luxury tours, uh, but we have an amazing, we got everybody to go into next year's uh, uh, tours and uh, they're small tours. Everything's included, tipping, everything. I'll be on some of them. Uh, Oh, I was just giving a commercial. Uh, yeah, I, 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 somehow I clicked something and left the room. I took, but I, I took advantage of your absence to pitch <laughs> tour. You were pitching. Hey, I we're with Rudy really Maxa, good. but yes, go check. He's got tours. He's got radio. Next he's year. got television. He's got great. But but what, what, he, he, those, but what he really is, he is a savvy traveler. So before I shut down, yes, one hot, hot, hot steaming tip for our audience today about travel in the uh, – in the future. Tell you how to avoid crowds at the, the Eiffel Tower. Let's hear it. Now you've had to take several girlfriends and children and grandchildren to the Eiffel Tower. It's useful. Uh, on the first level up is a, is a Michelin starred restaurant by Alan Ducasse called Jules Verne. And if you book a lunch or a dinner at Jules Verne, there's a dedicated elevator that gets you up there. And from there, you can go to the floor. You don't have to pay any ticket to go up the Eiffel Tower. You don't have to wait in interminable lines. You don't have to book ahead. Just make your reservation at Jules Verne. It's fairly pricey, but if a couple of you go, it's worth it. It's worth it. And the wine is good, too, I'm sure. Yeah, they've got a hell of a wine list, yes. Yeah, I'm sure. Well, listen, we've kept on uh, our people a little bit. I wanted to thank everybody for tuning in to the Journeys webcast and thank my guests, Rudy Maxa, uh, maxatours.com and Rudy Maxa's World. Um, this has been great. We could talk about travel for hours, I know. Yes. But what we need to do is uh, hopefully get past this uh, this this post-pandemic world and uh, and drink this wine um, together. So in cheers. Right. <laughs> yeah. Cheers. Left here. Oh, you've got a little left, right. Thank right. you for having me on. Great fun, Alan. I appreciate it. Yeah, yeah. What's for dinner tonight? Uh, I have some a little lamb, some little lamb chops that oh, I'm going nice. to do from a local farmer. And see, I don't eat much meat at all, but they look so good. I thought, well, they're tiny. I can eat a little meat. So. Hey, uh, lamb is, by the way, my favorite. So you just got my appetite wet. And, okay, well, um, Dara, still slip, Dara still uh, uh, sleeping here. Uh, I don't think we can get her in here but uh another what time dara dar d-a-r named after the capital of uh, tanzania you don't think i knew that dara salam <laughs> is that her full name that's her full name right so when they go to the vet they have that logged in but yeah, but I'm you sure. that, you call her dara salam right <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Oh, that's pretty good. Well, thank you again. Um, thank you. Next week, I've got a guest from South Africa, Joe Rust, uh, who is a another motorcyclist, and she has got an amazing story uh, how she was traveling through Africa on a bicycle and somebody stole it and how that led to a life of uh, adventure on a motorcycle. So tune in next week, uh, Journey's Webcast. It'll be on uh, – I'll send you an email and – Looking forward to it. Thanks again, Rudy. We Thanks, will, Alan. Uh, Thank Honor to be on. Thank you. Good. Yes, great to have you. Thanks. All right. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you for tuning in to the Journeys webcast. I'm Alan Carl, your host. Be sure to tune us in every Monday. The time changes depending on where we are in the world. This is Alan Carl, and where will your next journey take you? <laughs>